Good morning. It is such a delight and an honor to be here on this stage with you. I never would have pictured um, life looking this way. To be honest with you, speaking was a huge fear of mine growing up. And so I'm very thankful that God has just given me this opportunity to speak hopefully some truth and life into your heart and your soul today. Let's pray together before we begin. God, you're good, you're holy, you're righteous, and you're our king. And God, you gave us your word. And your word has transcended time and space. And right now in the here and the now, we pray that you speak to us through your word. Let nothing come out of my mouth that is not necessary for the uplifting of you and your kingdom, Father. Nothing more and nothing less. Teach us together, help us to grow and to learn and to breathe. Amen. What happens when you sit down with somebody to have a hard conversation? What's the very first thing that you do? (sighs) That's what I do. I take a big, deep breath. It's what I do every night at 8 o'clock once my kids are in bed. (sighs) And then I try to decide, do I clean, do I work, or do I just go on to bed? Usually I go on to bed. But breathing is essential. It's part of our lives, and it's something that God has given us, the breath, to create life and to create hope. I'd like for us all just to take a moment and take three deep breaths together. Nose breaths, please. And if you're out there watching online, breathe along with us. But just let's pause for a moment and take three deep breaths. Ready? Go. Doesn't that always make you feel better? A good deep breath never makes me feel worse. Just like exercise never makes me feel worse afterwards. But we forget to do it, don't we? Here's what happens when we breathe. Your diaphragm contracts, and then it moves downward. This increases space in your chest cavity and causes your lungs to expand. And when your lung expands, air enters your nose, travels down your windpipe to your bronchial tubes, and then air reaches your lungs and enters your air sacs, and oxygen is passed into your bloodstream. That's just the inhale. All that happened in one breath. How cool is that? Only God could come up with that. So when we exhale, exhale, our diaphragm relaxes a bit and moves into our chest cavity. And when that space gets smaller, carbon dioxide is forced out of your lungs, then out of your nose or your mouth. Breathing is essential. And so is Scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Today I want to shine just a big spotlight right on that verse and really dissect it and ask ourselves, what would it really look like if we let God's word Do what it's designed to do. God gave us this book. What do we do with it? Well, here's how it all happened in the beginning. God took his big breath and he began his best work when he blew light into the darkness. Darkness was already there. And he blew his breath and light overcame darkness. It it pierced through the void and into the unknown. From there, his breath brought another grand design. He took his breath, and he took dust, and he got really creative, and he made Adam. And when he was creating Adam, he was creating us. And from there, he took part of Adam, and he created Eve. And when he did that, he created 
I think one of his best ideas, which is marriage. After that, he had another idea, a very good idea. And so he brought children into the world through Cain and through Abel. And so when he did that, he breathed the idea of family. And I firmly believe in the depths of my heart that the idea of family is under major attack right now. And we need to be on guard and we need to be protecting and loving our families like we never have before. All right, finish this line for me. Family, you can't live with them. Somebody has felt that before, like me. (laughs) And you can't live without them. Isn't that so true? We especially feel that way sometimes during holidays and all that closeness. So I want to introduce you to my family. Some of you may know them. We're going to pull up a picture. This was last year at the beach. So that is my husband, Daniel, and my oldest son is Weston, and my youngest is Hudson. They are full of adventure and life and just things that make me go, hmm, and and breathe deeply. But um, if I had to describe them in one word, I would say my husband, Daniel, is patient. My oldest, Weston, is very passionate, and my youngest, Hudson, is our worker. He loves to work in the yard, and he loves to mow, and I hope that just stays with him until he leaves our home. But a few weeks ago, I was on Facebook, and I saw this meme, and it said something to the sorts of, you know, I thought my parents were so cool having pizza night and movie night every Friday. And then I just realized they were just tired. And I really can relate to that now because Friday comes and we're tired. And we want to give our kids a fun little memory. So it's fun to pop on a movie and pop some popcorn or get a good, get a good pizza. But movie nights were a huge part of my upbringing. And my brother and I would kill a movie in the sense that we would watch it over and over and over and over. And one of those movies from my childhood that I watched probably 180 times um, was The Never Ending Story. Raise your hand if you're a fan or you've watched The Never Ending Story. Oh, goodness, there is not enough hands up. (laughs) So if you've watched it, just let this movie clip we're about to show kind of take you back. If you've never watched it, let this be an invitation over the next few days to to, to just watch it. Let's check it out. He doesn't understand that he's the one who has the power to stop it. He simply can't imagine that one little boy could be that important. Is it really me? Maybe he doesn't know what he has to do. What do I have to do? He has to give me a new name. He's already chosen it. He just has to call it out. But it's only a story. It's not real. It's only a story. Bastion! 
Raise your hand if you're going to see that movie. Please. And for the life of me, I still don't know what name he screamed. Does anybody know? Moonchild. Thank you. Moonchild. I got the answer. I've been wondering my whole life. I could have Googled it, but thank you. You get some points in the back. Um, wow. I love the part when Bastion is sitting there talking to a book, telling the book it's not real. It's just a story. And then in the next breath, what's he doing? He's, he's talking again to it like it is real. Bastion's the main character, and his words and his actions while he's reading it are affecting the whole story. And the things that he does change the never-ending story. And everything depended on his ability to hear and call out the name Moonchild. Can you imagine a book that engages the reader on a personal level like that? That invites you to read it and to hear it and to respond to it? To do something with it? You guys, our Bible is a never-ending story. And that makes me excited. My oldest son cannot grasp yet the understanding of eternity and how we're going to live forever. And I can't either. But I believe it. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And all fear is gone. So as we are participating in, in this story, our prayer every day needs to be Matthew eleven fifteen, 15, which says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Every day, wake up and say, God, give me ears to hear today. That'll be enough to start your morning. Today, I really hope you hear something true and helpful that you can walk away and say, oh, not because I said it, because his word says, said it. Did you guys know that in order to learn how to read, you have to first learn how to hear? In my former life as a literacy teacher, I spent every single day teaching children how to read. And so they'd come to my table, and the first thing we would do would be ear exercises. And I'd train them to say sounds correctly and to hear them and then manipulate them in different ways. And I knew... When I got them to a place where they could hear the sounds in words, that I could teach them to look and say those sounds in words. Reading scripture is the same way. Yes, we read scripture with our eyes, but we need to read scripture with our ears too. To go into our Bible time reading with an attitude of, what am I going to hear today? And what am I going to go do today with what I've heard? So when I read my Bible, um, I love acronyms. I'm still a teacher at heart, and it just helps me remember. One of the acronyms that I use is the HEAR method, and we're going to pull that up on the screen. And HEAR just helps me move through Scripture so I don't get lost in it because my mind can wander really fast. So the H stands for highlight. And basically, that's just saying, hey, what matters here? What word popped out to me? What sentence really struck me? E is for explain, and that's where we just simply explain what's going on. What's happening here historically? What's happening um, with the characters, and where are they? And then A stands for apply which means you ask yourself, what does this mean for my life? God, what do you want to teach me through this? Or God, what do you want me to do now? And then lastly, the R is respond. And that is usually a big exhale back to God, responding um, to all of the teaching and understanding that he's laid on my heart. I don't know how you read your word. This is not a prescription. It's just an idea. Some people, um, I know Justin uses the SOAP method with his youth. Um, there's other things out there that can help you move through Scripture systematically. But I want to give us a chance today um, to actually practice this and use it with some particular stories from Scripture. So 
If you brought your Bibles, I would love for you to turn to Luke 14, 1 through 6, or you can check it out on the screen. And if you're online, go grab your Bible, open it up to Luke. Our small group is studying Luke right now, and it's been awesome just to gather each Monday night and hear everyone's thoughts and questions and reflections. I encourage you, if you are new here and you are not in a small group, get in one. It's amazing. It changed my life, and it made me feel connected and in community with our church. We'll start new groups, I believe, in January or February, but there's still a few weeks left to join. All right, so let's read Luke 14, 1 through 6, and I'm going to be keeping in mind our here as I'm reading. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Or not. But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So as I was reading this with my highlighter, I highlighted the word Sabbath. And I highlighted the word, words, watching him carefully. And then I highlighted, they could not reply. Those were the things that stood out to me. And so I started, I started thinking about Sabbath and what Sabbath looks like in my life. And then I thought about how they were watching him carefully. They were not watching him just to watch and be amazed. They were watching critically. They were watching to see what thing he could do that would discredit his authority. Those are the kind of eyes the Pharisees walked around with, with very critical eyes. And I hope and pray no matter how much I read and no matter how much knowledge I gain, I never walk around this world with critical eyes. And then lastly, they could not reply to these things. There was nothing to say back to Jesus. Silent. Hmm. So, let's move on to the E. Oh, it's not back there. Sorry. The E, the explain. So, Jesus was basically living his ministry under very close observation. They were critical of him but we know the rest of the story and that Jesus' authority, um, he, he lived it here on earth and then he took it with him as he sat down on the throne. And then guess what he did with that authority? He gave it back to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we get to walk around every day with that same power and that same authority that he walked around with. And that is enough good news for me every single day to get up and to know my worth, and to know his worth. So how does this apply to me? The, the next um, letter in the acronym is A. How does this apply to me? I wrote that I am a letter, and it's important to let my neighbor know who Jesus was, who he is, and who he's going to be, and always will be. I'm a letter. You're a letter. Every day. So the R, that's our prayer or response back to him. That's our big exhale back to him. And this is what I wrote last week. Father, today you showed me the beauty of your healing and your love that you brought to a room. Help me live like that. Keep my eyes from being critical and my ears drawn to your word. So that's one way. You can move through scripture, take some time, and really reflect as you go. And then you walk out ready for your day. Let's do one more because that was so fun, right? Right? We love the word. All right. So let's move on to 7 through 11. Now, this is the parable of the wedding feast. 
And as you guys probably know, weddings were a little bit different in the Jewish tradition and culture back then than they are now. They were long. They were extensive. I think they stretched a week or two or however long that they wanted to celebrate. But it was a big deal. And it was a big deal who sat at what table. It mattered, and whoever was most important was seated first and in a, in a certain place. So let's read Luke 14, 7 through 11, and listen and hear um, for what God wants us to hear from this today. Now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, I'm going to make you all work for a minute. I want you to turn to the person beside you, and I just want you to pick out a highlight. Pick out a word or a phrase that stood out to you, and just turn and share it. Go. That was beautiful. Muffled words. I couldn't hear one, but that's okay. <laughs> Maybe yours were this. I picked out, he noticed how they chose the places of honor. Jesus is a noticer. Like, everywhere he goes, he's noticing. He's paying attention. He's paying attention to us. He's paying attention to our words. And I also circled a so that Go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, here's my other one, friend, move up higher. Say that with me. Friend, move up higher. Love that. So to explain it, Jesus is teaching here about honoring and valuing others before self. He's also teaching that when you do that, when you lift up someone else, he wants to lift you up with them. That's a cool promise. Why would you not want that, right? What a great promise. It works for everybody involved. So for me, my application is choosing to constantly celebrate others and forgiving people when I don't want to. It means loving people unconditionally and sitting down in the lowest place. That's what it means for me. My R was help me remember to let others lift me up and look for ways to exalt and celebrate my neighbor. Okay, simple way, moving through scripture, and now we can walk out with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of application for our day. So Jesus goes on, if you keep reading, um, he tells another parable of a great banquet, and he goes on to say, hey, if you go to a banquet, you know what you need to do? You need to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Man, I forget that sometimes. For people who aren't going to return a favor for you. His command here is to invite the uninvited. Speaking of uninvited, I have one more movie clip. This movie, I have a feeling everybody knows it. I'll wait and just let it show itself. But I encourage you just to think for, for a moment while you're watching this. What does it look like when we give grace? When we give somebody what they don't deserve, what does it look like? Let's check this movie clip out. Huh? 
Uh, hello. Hi. Remember me? Yes, yes, I do. I remember you. My name is Cindy Lou. Cindy Lou who? It's nice to meet you, Cindy Lou. Uh, oh, my name is Grinch. And, uh, this is Max. <laughs> Whoa, nice to meet you, Max. <laughs> I just came to invite you to our house for Christmas dinner. What? Me? But I took your gifts. Yeah, I know. And your trees. Yep. I stole your whole Christmas. I know you did. But we're inviting you anyway. But why? Because you've been alone long enough. Dinner's at six. Don't be late. And make sure you bring your sweet doggy too. Me? You're inviting me? Oh my gosh, the Grinch was so, so shocked, wasn't he? He knew he didn't deserve it. He knew what he did. He knew his sin, if we want to call it that. You guys, people know. I know. I know when I've messed up. I know when I'm carrying around dark and heavy stuff that is not good for me. I know it. And I am so thankful that I have had people in my life that have believed in me in my darkest places. And if you've ever been in that dark place, there is light. God breathed that. And there is light for you. If we could all be like that little preacher, Cindy Lou Who, like, she preached a little sermon to him. She really did. She was so full of joy, her heart did not have any room for bitterness, anger, unforgiveness. There's a new book out. I love good books. Um, by Lisa Turkhurst, I believe, that is called Forgiving What cannot be forgotten or something to that sort. And I can't wait to read it because if, if you feel like you don't struggle with forgiveness, I just ask you to like rethink that thought. Because there are some days I walk around and think, oh, I don't, I don't struggle with that. I can forgive people easily. And overall I can. But that doesn't mean I don't struggle with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So just, just remember that. So if we know that all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, then God's word says that God's word needs to be known, right? It, we, we can't breathe out something we don't know. I couldn't get up here and tell you how to perform heart surgery because I have no idea how to do that. But I do know just a little bit about loving Jesus and what that looks like. So I can stand up and, and do that. So we cannot love what we do not know. We cannot love what we do not know. My oldest son, Weston, knows more about sports statistics than anyone. I mean, it's daily. Mom, did you, did you know this? I, I can't even regurgitate it because it blows my mind how he knows all the sports names and numbers and what they did five years ago. And, oh, man, if you ever want to talk sports, get connected with him. But he breathes it out constantly, in and out. It's just natural. Now, for me, one of my past passions was teaching kids to read. And so I read a book, um, I think over quarantine back in March or April, called The Knowledge Gap. And this book was all about how kids come into school and there's this huge gap because they've had different experiences from birth until five years old. Some kids come in knowing their letters and their sounds and their numbers and how to string words together and read them. Others need to be taught how to hold a pencil and even how to flip through a book. I've experienced it all. And so the book's premises was how do we help bridge that? Well, my answer is, is family is one way, the church and the body coming alongside of our children. But the way they said to do it is building content knowledge. If you want them to know more about the periodic table, well, then start early and teach it to them. 
If you want your kids to know how to, I don't know, do uh, take care of a car, then you teach them how to take care of a car at an early age. Some of you who are working now probably are doing things that you learned how to do because your mom or your daddy taught you. So giving away knowledge is a, is a gift. Knowledge is a gift. It gives us more depth. It gives us more understanding. But it also gives us a love of something. So it's not really the knowledge that gives us love, but once we know it and we own it, then love can start to work its way into it. You know people, right, who when you talk to, you know they just love something so much. You can feel it coming off of them. So we cannot love what we do not know. And so God wants us to know his son more than anything. God's word says says also that his word is profitable for reproof and for correction. Now, reproof is kind of like a rebuke. And neither one of those words sound great coming out of my mouth. They sound kind of negative. Do they sound negative to your ears? Just not words that we love. A few weeks ago, I was talking to a staff member. He's not here today. If you want to think about who you haven't seen. He told me I could tell. Um, But he made this comment. He said, I like to follow the rules I like to follow. (laughs) I love that. I was like, me too. (gasps) Because we do. We organize our rules. Because let's be honest, there are some really dumb rules out there. Have y'all ever read like weird laws that different states have? And you're just like, who came up with this? I think it's like Singapore, you can't chew gum. I mean, there's just so many weird things. And so as humans, we like to organize our rules by the rules that we like. Now, raise your hand if you would call yourself a rule follower. Who's a rule follower? I'm going to put my hand right here. (laughs) I am not raising it up really high. But I listen to my leadership, right? (laughs) (laughs) so we can admit the game of life has some pretty bad rules but there's also some really good rules that save us every day aren't we thankful for stoplights and stop signs and lines on the road that teach us where to go like those are things that we that we need but if we can learn to love God's law in scripture Then we learn to love the one who breathed them. They work together. And when we love the one who breathed them, then he can do his work and breathe life into us and give us the Holy Spirit that teaches us about truth and grace again and again and again. One morning in October, um, we were on our way to school And some of you may know um, Patrick Bumgarner. He goes here. He's not here for this service. But we pulled out behind Patrick. And we're driving to McCaddenville. And we always get there at the light. And we typically turn left. Well, my oldest son, Weston, says, Mom, I want you to turn right because Patrick is going that way. And I know he always goes that way. And that way's faster. I want you to go that way. And I was like, okay, but just for today, because I like to turn left. I like to see the pond that's on my left. I like to see the sun because it's always kind of rising right above it, and there's fog that lifts, and I just like that little tiny breath. Even if my kids are screaming and singing in the back, it's like a little space in time that I love to move through. So we go on to follow Patrick. And Weston says, Mom, people really like to just go their own way, don't they? And I said, yes, sir, especially you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we do. We like to go our own way. That's in us. We're born with that. That's called our flesh. Have you all felt the difference between your flesh and your spirit? Oh, yeah. You know it. And you show it. 
<clears throat> By the way, if you want to know if Patrick is a rule follower, he is. He went 20 miles per hour the whole way through McCaddenville. <laughs> now, that was going uphill. I'd like to follow him downhill and see if he can pull off a 20 mile per hour going downhill McCaddenville because I can't do it. I try because rules matter. The last part of our scripture in Timothy, it says that scripture trains us in righteousness. And righteousness is the quality of being right. Do you like to be right? Does it feel good to be right? Yeah, we do. This involves beholding God and saying, God, you are God. And you are good. And I trust what your word says. And I'm going to follow it. It also means being willing to become like Christ. That's part of our mission here at the point is we want to become like him. And we can't become like someone we do not know. We got to know him. And then after that, we partner with the Holy Spirit. And we live a life with reverence and honor and excitement. And we basically just wake up every day waiting for the Holy Spirit to show up and speak. He spoke to me last night when we were at Webb Custom Kitchen, best food in Gaston County. Um, we were sitting there eating, and we were waiting on our food. And all of a sudden, a song started playing. And this was the song. The never-ending story. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. What? So that's why I felt pretty good about stepping up here today. That was the Holy Spirit just singing into my soul. So what's training in righteousness and holiness look like? It might look like desiring his will over your dreams. It could look like serving from a place of grace and gratitude. It might be asking yourself, how can you invest in God's kingdom instead of being a consumer that asks, what has God done for me today? It might mean that you just get so sick of your sin cycle and you seek out repentance. I get so sick of myself. And that's the gift that God brings me back to his word. So I don't stay sick of myself. Don't stay sick. So these are all fruits of righteousness. Outward signs that we might display, we might um, have a willingness to include others, to invite the uninvited, to uplift others, or to share your testimony. Inward signs might mean that you have a desire to study on your own, that you wake up every day and this is what matters most, or praying for a friend when they need you. It's operating from a place of rest and a place of hope. Okay, so to finish up, as, as we think about God's breath, in the beginning, his breath pierced the light, right? Broke through, and then all the amazing things started happening. So let's consider what his last breath created. In Revelation 22, 6 through 7, John says, These words are trustworthy and true. That's a great promise. That's what we should carry every day as well. These words can be trusted. And then God breathes this last breath back. And this, this breath is another one that it's just some news that, that should be enough. He says, behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Can we let his breath just be enough for today? That the promise of heaven is near? Maybe nearer than we think. Or it might be in a thousand years and it doesn't really matter. Because what matters is that his word is trustworthy and true. There's another promise that our shepherd, he's going to gather us all up, all of us crazy sheep, and he's going to lead us into forever. And so we're going to finish up today with a promise and a parable in Luke 15. And I want us today, as we read the parable of the lost shepherd, I want this parable to teach us, correct us, and train us. Okay? All right. So Luke 15, 1 through 7. 
Now the tax collectors were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he had, has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The point of this parable is not just that there were 99 sheep left behind. The point of the parable is is that he came after one. And what happened when he got that 91? There was rejoicing. And guess where there was rejoicing? In heaven. My friend Andy Rachels is in my small group. And as we were reading this on Monday night, she said, can you imagine what that must like be like? Joy in heaven? It's better than any joy you've ever experienced here and now. It's so much better. I can't wait to experience joy in heaven. God breathed this book for you because he wants to prepare you for his joy in heaven. But he also gave you this book because he wants you to in the here and the now, to experience him and to know him. And the whole point, the so that from this message is that he wants you complete and equipped for every work here and now. When I came on staff here, there was an extensive amount of... um, training that had to be done. Had to go through multiple interviews. Had to learn things about the church I didn't know about the church. I had to learn things about children's ministry that I didn't know about. I had to connect with Cindy and with other people and just find out, what am I supposed to do here? And I'm still asking, what am I supposed to do here? And I'm so thankful to work for a place that cares about every little detail. If you haven't noticed it, I'm I'm surprised because You feel it when you walk in here, and I hope you feel it when you walk out. There is joy in heaven, and there is joy at the point, church. So let's let God's word do what it says it will do. And let's open our Bibles so that we can breathe again. Let's pray. God, you're good. You breathe light into darkness, and it broke through, and your creation took over. God, we are always your sheep in need of your voice, in need of correction, training, knowledge, all of the things that your Bible says we need. And we just pray today that we can be recipients of your truth, that we allow the grace and goodness to come alongside of us and say, we are enough as we are right now. I am loved. I am chosen. But let's not just let that grace be enough. Let's let truth come behind and say, you're not enough yet because you need my spirit. You need to be walking with me through the dark, through the unknown. God, thank you for every person in here. I hope that their ears are wide open. And God, when we hear We can go out and speak. There is good news to share, and let us never, ever forget that. Thank you, thank you, and amen.